sound or video problem. So we're just waiting for the projector to warm up again. Well, I'll go ahead and start. I don't have any slides, so I'll go ahead and start. Um, thank you for coming. Great, thank you. Um, I want to start by thanking Dr. Jed Schilling, who uh, right here, um, who is our host, who enabled us to come here. He's a member of the Cosmos Club, and uh, he was able to get us in. And, yes, and he's on the board of the Mountain Institute. So that was the the connection that got us into this beautiful venue. Um, Dr. Schilling has an interesting history. He taught at Boston College. He has advised the Moroccan government on national planning, and he worked at the World Bank for about 30 years. Um, and now he gets to host us here. <laughs> um, thank you very much. So I'm John Furlow. I'm with USAID. Um, I think most of you I've seen over the last two days, thank you for coming back. I think that's a good sign. Um, today we're going to focus on, uh, this morning we talked about the Adaptation Partnership, which was a, a program that the State Department and USAID put on along with the Spanish government and the Costa Rican government. And that partnership, which was meant to catalyze activity and action in the adaptation sphere, spawned a number of different um, communities of practice and interesting projects that took on a life of their own. And one of them is the High Mountain Partnership. Tomorrow we'll be hearing about the, uh, the urban program that we started following an adaptation partnership workshop in Bangkok. And then on Thursday, Thursday is Climate Services Day. And the third big sustainable program that was born out of the, that adaptation partnership was the climate services work that we've been supporting. Um, our work, my work, with both the Mountain Institute and mountains and glaciers uh, goes back to 2009. Not much before, I grew up in Florida, so um, no mountains there. Um, Alton and some of, the, some of his colleagues at the Mountain Institute came to me when I had first started at aid and said, you know, we, we think that mountains are an important environment that's vulnerable to climate change. <clears throat> We'd love to work with aid. Let's figure out a way to do that. It took us a while because aid had no funding at that time and the Mountain Institute didn't have enough to pull together what we wanted to do. But the National Science Foundation was able to support an initial workshop looking at <clears throat> the question that we asked was, if your water storage system fundamentally changes, if you depend on glaciers and the freeze-thaw cycle, um, what do you do when that changes? And we were able to put on an initial workshop with maybe 85 or 100 people in Juarez, Peru. We had, I think, one or two days of field visits. And uh, the whole thing was about a week or 10 days. And it was great, but we weren't sure where it would go. Um, and at the end of that workshop, we brought, we were able to, it was mostly people from the Americas, the United States and South America. We had one person from ISIMA, the Inter, Inter Mountain Institute for Thank you, Alton. Um, <clears throat> International Center for Integrated Mountain Development. Um, we brought over a guy named Pradeep Mool from Isimad in Nepal. And at the end of it, he said, you know, this was all great. I care about agriculture. I care about water management, et cetera. But what, I'm really, what was really interesting to me was 
the fact and the way that the Peruvians have managed the risk of glacier lake outburst floods. Could we do this again in Nepal and bring some of the Peruvians that have been doing this for 30, 40 years to Nepal and let us learn from them directly? And I kind of thought, wow, this, I don't know if we can do that, but then the Adaptation Partnership came along and we were able to take some of those funds and that interest and pull it off. <clears throat> so that's what we're gonna hear about today. We're gonna get to see several videos um, and hear about some of our small grants. We're gonna hear from Cesar Portocarrero about ways of managing glacier lakes. Um, we're gonna hear from Greg Leonard about a SETI River disaster from two years ago, three years ago, 2012. Um, we're gonna hear from Uliana, one of our grantees. And um, of course, we're gonna hear from Alton and from John Cook over there. I'll introduce everyone as they come up, but I wanted to give you a quick preview. Um, this has been really fun work. I've had the, the privilege to work with the mountain team and to go to the beautiful places where mountain people live and do their work. It's been a lot of fun. Um, Jonathan got to go on some of the trips as well. We both have a very hard time explaining to our colleagues at work that it's very important that we do this stuff, that we're not just going hiking. Um, and I hope at the end that when you've seen the videos and heard the stories that you'll recognize how beautiful it is in some of these places, but it's also uh, the work is very important and, and people's lives and livelihoods are truly at risk. Um, so with that, oh, one bit of housekeeping. Um, or several. I've been telling you about the web page, the web portal that the Climate Office is setting up. I'm sure that you've been asked, but uh, we want to, to do a, a soft launch of this new web portal. Um, so when you checked in, you should have been asked if you would like to sign up for, uh, to be a part of the soft lunch, launch. Um, they will send you an email with a password and then you can log in and begin accessing all the materials and resources that the Global Climate Change Initiative at USAID has developed over the last, I guess, six years. Um, this, the next thing is we, I think we've been moved for Thursday to a larger room at the Carnegie Endowment. So if you are interested in joining us for the Climate Services Day in the morning, or I guess the whole thing, we have a larger room, so please, uh, you should have received an email already from Lily with a link to the additional sign-up. Um, I have not had much time this, this week to check emails, but I did see that one. Um, so please, if you're not registered and you would like to attend that, please sign up and join us on Thursday at 9 at the Carnegie Endowment. And with that, I think that's all of the housekeeping. I'll turn it over to Alton. Oh, Alton Byers, let me introduce you, because I keep forgetting to do that. I'm sorry, I really will go away in just a minute. Um, Alton Byers is the Director of Research at the Mountain Institute. He's also been a friend and colleague for five or more years, um, and he has taken me on some of the greatest uh, work trips <laughs> of my life. Um, and it's been a real, a lot of fun working with both the, the entire Mountain Institute, but particularly with Alton, who introduced me to Cesar, and, uh, and a lot of other great people. And really, it was Alton's energy and drive and spirit that pulled this high map program together. So thank you. Okay, do we have a slide changer? Can you, could you move the computer here, maybe? That'd be much easier for me, because I flip around a lot. <laughs> so, uh, today I'll be talking about the uh, High Mountain Adaptation Partnership. It's a project that's uh, implemented by the Mountain Institute and um, the uh, University of Texas at Austin. Okay, thank you. And what I'll be doing today, you're, you're, you'll get the 15-minute version of the 
presentation today, so I have a little more time and I can maybe tell a few more stories. Um, but I'll be giving a, a broad overview of the project and then my colleagues can fill in more detail. So for example, if it's about glacial lakes, we have uh, uh, Cesar Portocarrero, who has 40 years of experience in controlling glacial lakes. If it's about our climate scientist grantee program, we have Uliana and, and Greg. Uh, and if it's about uh, lessons learned, we have Jonathan Cook. So I think it'll be very interesting. I'd also like to thank Jed Schilling for arranging the venue today and also welcome our executive director, Andrew Tabor, and chairman of the board, Bill uh, Beto. Uh, thank you very much for coming. Now, this program takes place in two areas. One is the Mount Everest region of Nepal, which represents a re remote, rural, roadless area, and the other is the Cordillera Blanca of Peru, which is uh, very much an urban mountain setting. And you may ask, well, why did we start a high mountain project? And there are many, many good answers to that, but one is that it's a changing mountain world. These are photographs taken back in the 50s during the early Mount Everest expeditions, and um, it doesn't look like that anymore. The ice is melting, and it's melting very, very quickly, and it appears to be accelerating. Nepal started visibly losing its glaciers back in the 1960s and by the 80s and 90s, uh, many of the lakes, uh, glaciers had receded, leaving behind large and potentially dangerous glacial lakes in the event of an outburst flood. So what do I mean by uh, potentially dangerous? Well, there's the lake from another point of view, and there's the, uh, to the right is the glacier terminus. What's left of the glacier is calving every year, 35, 50, 100 meters per year. In the center is the lake, that's what's uh, the 75 million cubic meters of water, and the end moraine of loose boulders and material is all that's holding in that water. So if you get a trigger, like an earthquake or ice falling into the lake, it can create a swell that breaches the end moraine and unleashes millions of cubic meters of water uh, downstream. Now, in Peru, in the 1940s, there were three catastrophic uh, outburst floods in the Cordillera Blanca. Uh, this one happened around 47 and killed about 6,000 people. Our estimates, our models today suggest that if that flood happened again, given that the lake is about 10 times the size it was back in the 1940s, and because of population densities, uh, 35,000 people could be killed. So it's quite, quite an urgent problem. But the Peruvians, in the 50s, after these three catastroph catastrophic events, got together, formed a glaciological unit, did a survey of all the glacial lakes in the Cordillera Blanca, determined that 35 were dangerous, and began the process of decreasing the risk, decreasing the danger by uh, lowering, <clears throat> it could be different methods, it could be as simple as reinforcing the end moraine with a drain pipe underneath, or as sophisticated as another one of Cesar's projects of drilling a thousand uh, meters through solid rock. Um, but they developed these techniques and we felt this was information that really needed to be shared. So John told you about the 2009 workshop that led to the 2011 Andean Asian Knowledge Exchange Workshop where we took 35 scientists uh, from 15 different countries up to Imja Lake, the lake you, you saw a few slides ago. The purpose was to share experiences in both research methods as well as risk uh, reduction methods as well. And the heart and soul of that, of that uh, conference was to uh, promote Nepal-Peru exchange and collaboration. So there's Cesar talking to Karma Toeb from, from Bhutan. Uh, and Cesar has been working for, like, like I say, 40 years or so, and I think you have controlled 20 different lakes or 18 different lakes, which we captured in a handbook, the Glacial Lake Management Handbook, which is one of the outputs uh, of, the, of the project. It's become quite popular. It's also an opportunity to uh, meet with local people, uh, engage with the local people. We were very impressed with their knowledge of climate change, of the lake, but also by their sense of frustration over being left out of the dialogue. They said researchers have been coming up here for decades and never sharing the results of the work, and they were getting pretty frustrated. In fact, they were turning groups away uh, at about this time. They were not letting people go up to the lake because they felt that they were out, left out, out of the dialogue. And 
we thought, wouldn't it be great if we could do something to change that? And fortunately, six months later, we started the High Mountain Adaptation uh, Partnership, which was designed to fill these gaps. Okay. Um, some of the components of the High Map project, oh, and I must say, fill the gaps through integrating science into the community, the community consultation process in full partnership with local people. So we felt that's something we need to do up here to help solve the problem. Um, part of the, one of the attributes of the components of the project is our High, uh, high Map community of practice. That, in fact, was taken in 2013 when we brought the Nepalis and the Bhutanese back to Peru. And we had our, our workshop in 2013, and they had the opportunity to see firsthand uh, you know, many of these uh, glacial lake control projects. And that is, by the way, Lake Palcacocha. That's the one above Huaraz, which if it burst, would kill something like 35,000 people. It's extremely dangerous. My favorite part of the whole project, I think, was our Climber Scientist Small Grant Program. Um, that was a program that gave young men and women the opportunity to combine the best of lo laboratory, high-tech uh, modeling methods with traditional muddy boots on the ground uh, field techniques and in consultation with local people. All of the grant recipients had to have those three characteristics uh, within their grant to, to be accepted. Um, and they weren't you don't have to be a climber uh, to get one of these grants, uh, although Uliana certainly is, and so is Greg, but they were named after the early climber scientists in the 1950s, like, like Charles Evans. Uh, he was the uh, glaciologist and the deputy director of the 53 Everest expedition, and he actually got to within 200 meters of the summit of Mount Everest when his oxygen apparatus froze and in the interest of not jeopardizing the expedition, they turned around, he and Tom Bordillon, and they went back to, back to camp. Two or three days later, a young beekeeper named Ed Hillary and Tenzing Norgay Sherpa made it to the top, okay? But it's, we named the grants that in honor of this spirit, and that's certainly the spirit that people like Uliana and our other climber scientists have carried on. There is very little written about mountains in the literature, in the peer review literature, especially about high mountains. So we made a point from the very beginning of capturing and uh, all the lessons learned as much as we could and publishing these results in both the peer reviewed and, and popular uh, literature in order to increase awareness for, for mountains. 40, only 40% 40 of the countries that have glaciers in the world only 40% have something in the peer review literature about adaptation. So we're trying to, to uh, bridge that gap as well. Likewise, there's very little information about uh, glacial lakes uh, in the Himalayas. It's a relatively new phenomenon. Therefore, we established what we called a glacial lake ra rapid reconnaissance team that would allow us to go in and rapidly get the information that we needed to assess the lake. So this is a ground penetrating radar. It told us whether there was ice uh, in the moraine or not. That's very important. If there's ice in the moraine and you start digging, you might start a glacial lake outburst flood. Uh, we also did bathymetric surveys using sonar, which in, that's our boat. You can see the size of the boat compared to the icebergs uh, in that very rapidly calving uh, Imja Lake. Uh, that tells us the depth, the, the volume of the lake, the uh, topography of the lake, which in turn gives us insights as uh, to how we can reduce the level and reduce the risk. Um, and as a matter of fact, Dane McKinney, who's the co-manager of this project, is going back there this uh, August to supervise the construction of the lowering of this lake. They're not going to use a siphon. What they're going to do is that that outlet channel to the left, uh, they're going to dredge out and lower it by about three meters. And the heart and soul of the uh, High Mountain Project is what we call the science-based, community-driven uh, approach to adaptation, meaning that while we're holding uh, consultations in uh, 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 adaptation consultations with the stakeholders, we are also conducting uh, state-of-the-art uh, detailed field work on the glaciers in Nepal uh, and also in Peru. Then routinely sharing the results 
with local people, you know, is the lake dangerous, is it not dangerous, what are your options, what, what should we do, uh, which in turn was fed into the local adaptation plan of action, or the LAPA. And in this case, we used the government of Nepal method, a seven-step method. And even though there was uncertainty and a lot of ambiguity about the glacial lake at the beginning, people didn't know what to think, I think that the results of our research, which were fed into the consultation process, helped to rank GLOFs as the number one concern, a climate change adaptation concern. People realize if there is a GLOF uh, glacial lake outburst flood, especially in the Everest area, the tourist-driven economy is going to be destroyed for years and years, and that's going to affect not only Nepal, uh, 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 the Khumbu, but Nepal as well. In the Cordillera Blanca, we had a slightly different process. Um, Angelity and USAID went down to our Peru program in 2009 and trained our staff and local NGOs in what was being used then, the VNA method, a six-step method, the vulnerability and adaptation method, quite similar to the other methods you've heard about this week. So they were quite fluent in this particular approach to climate change education and, and adaptation. And it turned out we had two groups of stakeholders. One were the campesinos. Um, and, but, and they had no concern whatsoever about the glacial lake because they live above it. Okay, they're out of the path of a glacial lake, but quite concerned about water. And Peru has been losing its glaciers, visibly losing its glaciers, since the early 1900s. And that, combined with changing precipitation patterns, is causing a lot of concern, especially among the rural populations for the future of water supply. So that, that was their number one concern. The urban areas were different in that after the awareness building consultations and the, and the educational process, they realized that Paukokosha Lake was indeed deadly. And that is what they need uh, to focus on. Uh, like I said, if there were a flood which would come out of that valley uh, to, the, to the left of uh, the city of Huaraz, it could uh, kill uh, 35,000 people. So we ended up, in terms of results, with uh, the two uh, LAPAs, the two adaptation plans of action. And for me, I think the most exciting thing was seeing how engaged people were in the LAPA process, uh, how interested they were in the science, and how they integrated the science into the uh, final adaptation plan. It was also very rewarding to see that we were able, with our stakeholders, to fund many of the priority interventions, such as the early warning system, one way or the other, through direct grants or through mainstreaming, uh, we were able to fund the early warning system. The president of Peru is committed to finding the funds to lower the lake. Likewise, in Nepal, we mainstreamed that into um, <clears throat> a uh, UNDP project that Dane will be supervising this year. Uh, the lessons learned were very similar to lessons learned in the other CCRD components. That's something that was really interesting about the last two days. Um, we all agree we need to build relations with the proper uh, entities before the LAPA process and tailor the LAPA to local needs. Um, and it's too, you know, if there were a second phase of the CCRD, I think what I, would, what I would do, somebody asked that question today, is now work in terms of cross programmatic, uh, um, um, you know, relationships. In other words, um, you know, we need Joanne down in, in Peru, and we need Peter over in, uh, in, in Nepal. There, it would be really wonderful to have this sort of exchange at this point in time. Anyway, there are going to be challenges of working in these remote areas. They will continue, but we think that this interdisciplinary approach is the way forward, and especially, I think these lessons learned are pretty important. They're coming out as a separate document as well uh, because of AIDS' expanding portfolio of high mountain projects, no doubt in recognition of the critical importance that mountains play in provision of the world's fresh water as well as other ecosystem services. So it's been a wonderful uh, three years. I'd like to thank USAID and Angelity for their guidance and their support along the way. Thanks very much.
I think we have a video now which, yeah, which, which really illustrates very well some of the things I just tried to tell you, especially in terms of Nepal, Peru collaboration and exchange. And as some of the people interviewed say, some of the uh, community of practice members say, um, how similar things are, how similar what's happening in the high mountains of the, of the Andes is to what's happening in Peru. So I think you'll find this uh, an interesting video. Thank you. Should we, uh, Skylar, what if we skipped and John, would you be ready to and willing to jump up? So we'll, we'll switch the order and we'll have Jonathan Cook talk about um, the LAPA process and lessons learned and then we'll hopefully come back and have the video with sound in a few minutes. John? Uh, John is my colleague at USAID. Um, he has co-led the mountain work um, or led the mountain work uh, alternately. Um, and so we'll, uh, John's in the climate change office, and uh, over to you. Thanks. I'm, I'm not going to be nearly as exciting as the video, but the video is going to be great when, it, when it's working. So, uh, yeah, so I'm Jonathan Cook, as John said, in the climate change office. And, um, yeah, I've also been really privileged to be involved uh, a fair bit in the the high map work over the last few years. I've been with AID for three years, and I think it was one of the first things I actually got involved with when I started. John somehow was not able to to go on the the trek to Nepal that was in 2012, I think that one was. And so one of my first, I think it was my first trip for for USAID was to to the Everest Valley. I mean, people were like, "Are you kidding? What's this job you've just gotten?" But uh, I have to say, it's been it's been this is no pun intended, but it's been downhill ever since. That was probably the that was probably the peak of my, uh, of my travel. Um, so, sorry, sorry, okay, all right, moving right along. So I wanted to add a few thoughts really on what Alton's alluded to in his, in his really good introduction uh, on the LAPAs, which are the local adaptation plans of action that, um, that HIMAP worked on in Peru and in Nepal, and I think are you know, some of the really great accomplishments of the project. I think that this is a particularly interesting area for USAID because adaptation planning in general is, a, is an area that we're doing a lot of work in and support in. Um, and, you know, I think one thing to point out is, um, and by the way, a lot of these images are, are shamelessly pilfered from Alton, so you'll, you'll recognize some of them. Um, I think one really important point to make first off is just that the LAPAs are, they're documents, they're plans, they're, they're out on the document table and you can read them, but they're, they're also um, processes, right? They're, they're also, I think the LAPA processes did a lot besides just producing a document with a list of priorities. It, it really was a, a, a vehicle for building capacity, but also bringing in input and, and really a lot of knowledge from local communities into these processes. Um, it was a way to, to really align the different actors in these landscapes behind the key vulnerabilities and to talk about what the priorities should be. So, you know, yeah, at the end of the day, um, it was really great work. I think that, that those plans were produced, but I think the, the, the journey was really important as well, and I think that kind of came out in, in some of what Alton's already said. Just to talk a little bit about local adaptation planning in general, and I think why we found it really compelling in this case, um, I mean, there's a few obvious uh, points. You know, it's a getting down to that local level is really a great way to identify priorities from the bottom up and to really get some of the voices and the perspectives of in this in many cases vulnerable groups that are not included in the traditional planning processes that happen in you know capital cities and and ministries to really art articulate and identify their needs their priorities their thoughts um, Again, it's a great way also to build awareness and capacity. I think it was very much a two-way exchange where um, you know, the, the local people had a lot of knowledge and information to share and were also able to learn certain things that they weren't 
you know, knowing about or hearing about or finding out about before. So it was very much a, a two-way process. Um, I think the local adaptation plans are really important in the sense that they connect what we think of, we kind of categorize as autonomous adaptation with planned adaptation. So this is just the idea that these people in these environments are, are adapting, well, like it or not, they're, they're doing things differently because things are changing, seasons are changing, precipitation is changing. Um, and some of that is just, you know, responding in the way that they know best. And, um, but kind of putting that in the perspective, again, of with additional information about what's actually happening, some of the options that might be out there that are not being currently used in these areas. So it's kind of a chance to, again, put, put those two perspectives together. And then to hopefully inform the national planning, right? So in the case of both of these countries, there's national planning that's going on on adaptation. And these LAPAs were, I think, used as a, as a really nice way to feed into that, that national level planning and create, hopefully, some opportunities for implementation and for um, actually carrying forward some of those priorities. So that's one sort of, I guess, overarching lesson. I, I think another one is just the importance of working with, with recognized processes. I talked a little bit about this yesterday at the broader CCRD presentation, but I think it was really important in the case of the LAPAs, where in Nepal, the LAPA process, as Alton said, it existed, it was a, it was a officially recognized uh, vehicle by the government of Nepal. I think about a hundred of them had been done already. Somewhat problematic in some cases how they were done, but there was a really good uh, established, you know, recognized template that um, HIMAP was able to take and add value to and sort of carry forward in their work in Nepal. And that was then, you know, it was visible, it was linked to um, funding and to um, government institutions. In Peru, I don't think that that framework necessarily existed, but there were other ways that the, the LAPA team that was working under HIMAP was able to connect with, with national institutions and uh, funding opportunities. And so they, they made the same kind of end result in terms of you know, really getting this validated and recognized. A third really important lesson, Alton mentioned this, is I think really one of the highlights to me of the, the HIMAP approach was this link between really cutting edge science and really bottom up community driven approaches. Um, you know, we hear about this a lot in the adaptation world, but there's really not great examples of it actually. I think this is a really, to me, very um, persuasive example of how you really bring the communities into the science and you also bring their perspectives into the planning. So it was kind of a, a really nice mix of those, of those different um, approaches. And I think the South-South exchange that um, those workshops that took place in the different countries, uh, you know, that also really exemplifies that idea of, you know, bringing the scientists to visit other communities and to other countries. So I think, you know, that's something to me that really stands out um, in the HIMAP. Just really quickly, uh, we're here this week for the CCRD project to talk about climate resilient development. And I think uh, one of the innovations of the LAPAs that were done in this project versus some of the existing approaches was really to take that climate first, uh, sorry, climate resilient approach, development first approach, and kind of bring that into what I think traditionally in Nepal, this is sort of the diagram that the government of Nepal was using to explain local adaptation plans. And it really started with, you know, you can see step two is, is to do climate assessments and to think about every climate issue that was out there. Um, and what we brought in and what I think the team did a really nice job of, of bringing in to sort of modify that process was to start with development. It was again to go out to the communities, understand what really mattered to them in terms of their economies, their livelihoods, their day-to-day -day activities, and focus the climate discussions, that list that you saw that Alton showed of kind of the, the top priorities on those, you know, how they connected with those development uh, needs. And that really led, I think, to more ownership, more of a sense of priorities than you would normally get with, you know, a, kind of a laundry list of every single climate issue. Um, final issue, a lesson that I wanted to mention is kind of the mainstreaming thing, the, the sustainability and how, how to get the results of these plans reflected in, in action and implementation. And again, I think there's really nice examples in both countries. Um, in Nepal, uh, the team worked really closely with the, the Sagarmatha National Park, which is the Everest National Park and the buffer zone uh, plan that they have for the park. And I think that really helped them to uh, embed some of the results of the planning process into 
uh, again, a recognized, um, a recognized document, a recognized source of funds, and, um, and that was important. Uh, you know, I think there was a challenge because they were working across political units. They were working with a couple of, of different districts, and so they had to really look for ways to embed this in the districts themselves, but also in, in this case, a, a, a kind of an ecological unit that crossed, that crossed uh, the different districts. In Peru, there was a, a, another nice example of this, which was getting the two cities, Juarez and, and Independencia, I think, um, which were adjoining and had not normally worked together to actually form a commonwealth, form a kind of a unit that uh, was able to access for sources of funding uh, to bring in money to support some of their priorities. And so, again, really you know, looking for opportunities to get the, the priorities of the planning process reflected in, in action. Um, and, and I think action is, again, really important. As I said yesterday, plans are great, but stakeholders want to see results. And I think in both cases, um, these steps enabled um, the teams to, to actually access and help the stakeholders access some funding to actually do things. And so um, in Nepal, I think some money came in to rebuild some of the uh, infrastructure in the area that had been damaged by flooding. And in Peru, as you heard, there's some money coming from the government to support water supply um, improvements. And I think that's a real testament, again, to these, these links that were being made. So just to conclude, I mean, uh, I, I think the, the LAPA model that, that HIMAP piloted, which is going to be written up in this lessons learned document that is coming out quite soon from, uh, from the project, um, I think it's a really replicable model. I, we have great examples now from two countries, but I, I, I think it's a, a model of how to do really bottom-up adaptation planning with good scientific inputs that could be used elsewhere. It's, it's in, in a lot of ways, it's not mountain specific. I mean, we could take it to, to other countries and places, and I think we're trying to you know, share this example with some of our other uh, USAID offices and, and programs. But, um, but I think the, the model itself is really um, something that can work in a lot of other kinds of places as well. So thank you. And this is really exciting. I believe Alton told me that the in Nepal, the the after the workshop that John was a part of, they uh, one of the leaders from the um, the lodge owners association took part of the plan to the boundary commission and got about ten thousand dollars to rebuild fifteen thousand to rebuild some bridges and other parts of the trail. It is the only way that people can get up to Everest, but also to the lodges that generate a lot of the income in the area. And then on John's comment about the, um, the, the circular, the process that's in the official LAPA process for Nepal, if you saw the first circle is sensitization. And when I was out there about a year ago, a little under a year ago, um, I met with some people in a village and they said that after being sensitized, now they understand that a lot more, that everything is related to climate change, that slash and burn agriculture is driven by climate change. And I no, that's driven by you slashing and burning, and if you don't, it won't happen. Um, so I think one of the risks and one of the things that we like about the development first approach is that it's you bring in climate where it's relevant to the issues that are important to you, that are important to you, rather than driving all thinking on the the problems of climate change. Um, and. So here we go. Um, Alton didn't say this, but this video, which we got a very brief, quiet preview of, um, was made by his son, Daniel, um, who's made several videos for HiMap. Um, they're beautiful. And uh, it's been a lot of fun working with him. And we're going to see this one is on the, the third uh, sort of inner mountain workshop that we did two years ago in Peru. And then in a few minutes, we'll see one about Cesar. All right, let's, let's see if we can see it and hear it.
Asia. And so we have an opportunity for a group of people in the Andes who have had several decades of experience to take what they Climate change is driving a change in glaciers across the world, and we're kind of seeing changes in time. Glaciers all over the world are melting, but at different rates, and they've started melting more in some areas than in others. Peru has been dealing with melting glaciers for 50 years or more. It's a newer phenomenon in the Himalayas, and newer still in the Pamirs and some of the other mountains in Central Asia. And so we have an opportunity for a group of people in the Andes who have had several decades of experience take what they've learned and enable them to share their knowledge and their experience with the people of Nepal and Central Asia. So we've gathered a group of physical and social science researchers and development practitioners here in Huaraz. We've been able to hear from people both from the Andes, from the Himalaya Hindu Kush, as well as from Central Asia. USAID and the High Mountain Partnership have supported a climber scientist small grants program. We've been able to hear from each of the grantees about the work they've been doing over the last year. This workshop is very different from your typical workshop because we emphasize the field and field training so much. We want to get out of the conference room and into the field where the knowledge of our scientists and experts can be of real practical benefit to our participants as well as to local people and governments. We train participants in the use of ground penetrating radar on the 5300 meter Pastoruri glacier to determine the glacier's mass and thickness that will allow us to calculate change over time. We learned about the impacts of receding glaciers on water quality and water supply for the city of Huaraz. And we also spent a day with local communities discussing the local adaptation plan of action that they're developing to buffer the impacts of climate change. Today we visited the valley of Kilkai, which is located above the city of Huaraz. And part of what we're doing is activities in order to build that bridge, communication bridge between scientists and communities. The involvement of local communities, local institutions, is, is really key to, to attacking problems of, of possible glacier like outburst floods, or of, of attacking risk in mountain areas. We know that the glaciers have been receding actually since the 1850s, which is the end of the Little Ice Age. So that's why in 1940 you had lakes, then in 1941 a glacial lake outburst that destroyed much of what else. Starting in 1970, 80, 90, and today it's accelerating again. One of the great things about this program is it brings together people from different disciplines and from different areas, from different countries, with people here from Nepal, from, from Central Asia, and they all have a different perspective on glacial lakes, on mountain risks, on, on management of mountain areas. And that is, I think, quite unique. This is my first time in the Andes, and I'm really surprised to see the communities which are so similar to the communities back in Nepal, not only in terms of features, but also in terms of the lifestyles. Que también ellos de nuestros hermanos de Nepal están pasando también por esta desglaciación, ¿no? De sus nevados que tienen ellos, de sus montañas. Vemos con tanta extrañeza o tanta admiración de que Vemos de que nuestros glaciales están retrocediendo, desapareciendo. Yo creo que bastante significativo, porque en sí nosotros todavía no nos, no nos estamos dando cuenta de esto de lo que es el cambio climático. Y yo creo que es muy importante esto, doctor. Tres burras por todas, pues. The last few days, we'll, we're going to trek up to Lake Palcacocha, and we'll have an opportunity for hands-on learning led by the Peruvians that were in charge back then. Lake Palcacocha is one of the most dangerous lakes in the Cordillera Blanca, which burst in 1941 and killed about 6,000 people just right down there. It's now about 34 times the size it was after it burst in 1941, 
and our model suggests that if it bursts again, it's going to kill 30,000 people down there. So the risks and consequences have grown dramatically as the original dam built after the 1941 flood is now thought to be inadequate to the task of holding back the lake. We're going to go up to the lake where we will have the opportunity to learn from Cesar Portacarero, who was lead engineer on the Pauca project some 40 years ago. Cesar has managed 15 dangerous glacial lake projects in Peru, and he's a priceless resource for our colleagues from the Himalaya and Central Asia. This dam that you see here was finished in 1974. And it was built when the lake had half million cubic meters. But the current volume, we could assume, in more than 17 million cubic meters, 34 times the volume that we had in 1974. We think that the, the level of the lake has to be reduced in those 15 meters of the first 300 or 400 meters in this front part. So it's going to be a big work to protect the city of Carwas. the features, the characteristics, the structure of the moraine. Here we are, we are sure that there is not ice inside, but in India, as far as we know, there is ice in the moraine. We cannot excavate if there is ice. Otherwise, we could produce a globe. From this conference, I think it will help Nepal, Peru, or uh, other countries to mitigate the risk and to save uh, people from the cloth problem. So we got so much of the climate change conference мы имеем те же самые проблемы, которые бывают в горных странах, такие как Непал, Перу, Пакистан. Инициатива. Мы не должны иметь границ в сфере науки и Almost at the end. Is that right? About 20 more seconds. So rather than try to fix that, um, we can features the characteristics of this. We have the same problems that are in the mountains. So, um, will Yana, Greg, would one of you be willing to come a bit sooner? Will Yana? Skylar, can we do that? We'll let Liana go so that we're not watching two videos and that'll give you a chance to queue up the next one. So um, Liana is one of our climber scientist grantees 
Uh, she did work in Nepal. Um, I got to learn about it at the Peru conference two years ago. Um, and now we all get to learn about it. Liana? Hello everyone and thank you for this opportunity. So as it says, I'm a PhD candidate. I just turned in my thesis on Friday. I'll be, def <laughs> I'll be defending in a couple weeks. Um, so this is just gonna be a snapshot some of the highlights um, of my work. Uh, and this is on Nongzumpa Glacier, which is one of Nepal's largest and longest glaciers. And it's starting to develop a lake. Uh, it's in the small uh, phase of what could be. And so I'll be talking about supraglacial lake evolution Supraglacial means it's on the surface of the glacier and it's eating away at, through the deepening and expansion. So where in the world are we? Is there a laser pointer on this too? No. Okay, so we're in landlocked Nepal. Um, yeah, thanks. Okay, we're in landlocked Nepal between India and China. And I also had the opportunity to have a Fulbright Fellowship last year. So I lived in Kathmandu and then I would outsource to different parts of Nepal um, throughout my 10 months abroad. And so my field site is in the far eastern part of Nepal. And to get there, it's a harrowing 45 minute flight and you land on a steep runway that's probably 1500 feet. <laughs> and so from there, you still have to hike anywhere from three to seven days to get to the field site. And this is the Nongzumpa Glacier. For context, Everest is just off the screen here, but this is the Kumbu Glacier. And so it's just in the next valley over, but it's not really easy to get over there. You either have to go all the way around or take a high 17,000 foot mountain pass to get there. And the reason this one is important is we have Gokyo Village. We have the Spillway Lake is what it's colloquially called and a moraine dam that's holding it back. In cartoon form, this is what it looks like. It's sourced from Choyoyu, which is the sixth highest peak in the world. And it flows down the valley, 18 kilometers. Now this isn't quite to scale because the spillway lake at this point is only half a kilometer in fetch, in length. But all along the surface here, you have these superglacial lakes as well as a debris layer. Now this debris is key because if it's really thick, it can actually insulate the ice from melting. But the thinner it is, the more it can accelerate that melting. And then these superglacial lakes are believed to be connected via streams on the surface, through end glacial tunnels, as well as possible subglacial caverns. And again, here's this moraine dam. Um, it might or may not be ice cored um, if this starts to degrade and as the volume increases of the spillway, these Sherpa villages are at risk. So why should we care? We live in a changing climate. Melting glaciers is not just constrained to the polar regions, but also in the Himalaya. This is what Nongzumpa looks like from 17,500 feet. And you can see this extensive debris cover throughout. So where we have superglacial lakes is where the glacier is flat, less than two degrees. So you can pool the water instead of it flowing off. It can lead to enhanced melting because there are exposed ice walls surrounding these lake basins. And that can lead to accelerated melting. You have an increase in flood potential as you grow these volumes of water. And therefore, you can have a loss of life and infrastructure should it burst out. And the last major event in the Kumbu was in the mid 80s, which damaged a hydropower plant that was being built in Namche, which is the Sherpa capital of Kumbu. So the project objectives through the small grant as well as beyond, so this encapsulates the five year PhD, it was to make use of historical time lapse and field photos uh, in combination with previous depth maps of a variety of these lakes, not just the big spillway, but a lot of the smaller ponds further up the glacier and to create these 3D models of lake basins. I only have time to show one, but I've made about 16 of them during this time. And the purpose is to qualitatively and quantitatively document these changes. There's this huge visual impact through a movie that I'll be showing, but there's also you wanna put numbers on it. How fast is this changing? What can we do about it? So this is what Nongzumpa Glacier looked like in 1955. So this is south, and this is from the Schneider Expedition. And then what I'll do is show you what it looks like in 2009 a few times here. And so the things you see, emergence of this terminal lake, and this is what's called spillway. The growth of Gokyo, it has about 10 of these tea houses now and growing. And then the ice loss here is calculated to be almost a meter per year. And we did this with laser range finding binoculars and the old photos. So the superglacial lakes, the spillway is here 
And my first part of the project was looking at some of the smaller ponds, um, just about two kilometers further up Glacier. So I don't have time to show the footage from all these, but I do have DCAM, which is the one that's been changing the most. So the video, let's just jump to, and this is gonna, this is gonna be the record from 2011, 12, 13. And sound isn't needed, so I'll talk over it. It just had cool music. Uh, so in 2011, oh, it works. So watch these parts of the lake here and here. big drain here. In 2012, it lost a lot of volume. So the really cool thing about the time lapse is it captured multiple processes happening on this particular pond. You not only have end glacial inputs, but in 2013 is when we caught the first supraglacial uh, input from a flood from another um, lake nearby. And it caused this instant drainage um, of 20 meters. And so the important findings is from the time lapse, you can have these multiple drain and refill events during the monsoon. When you have satellite imagery alone, you're not gonna see it. And that's because you have too much cloud cover. Here we have an oblique view, and you could see even in the imagery, we didn't always have clear days. So the satellite imagery may underestimate how much volume this glacier is actually losing via its lakes. Um, during November 2012, on the grant, as when I went back to, um, this is the UCAM basin here. Um, and so this blue pond here existed in 2011. This showed up in less than a year. Brand new ice wall, brand new pond. And all throughout this surface here, it's hard enough walking on boulders where there's no trail. And you also have these ice plates, uh, about three inches thick, about this wide, just strewn about the surface everywhere, showing the maximum extent of the water during the monsoon, and then a sudden catastrophic drainage when it was already frozen. And this photo point here shows how it happened. This is one of these inglacial tunnels in the ice wall, and you can see the flow coming out there, frozen in place. And the drain mark there is around four meters. And this is another pond. You can just barely make out this lake level right there and how much it lost. And so the important findings is that the drainages can also occur even post freeze. And so the end of the melt season, which is typically the end of the monsoon in September, does not mean the end of volume loss for the glacier. It continues on. And what we've seen recently is that the lakes are still not freezing late into December. We're at 15,000 feet. So part of this expedition was also to create a new depth map for spillway. So these are the sub-basins of the spillway lake. And this is compared with results from 2009. Everywhere that it's red means that it's gotten deeper during that three-year time period, anywhere from 0.1 to 20 meters. And everywhere that it's, got, it's blue is where it's gotten more shallow. How does it get more shallow? Uh, well, this water is very turbid. It has a lot of sediment in it, and so that settles out. So you can have these layers of mud in the lighter blue, most likely. But where you have these deep blue colors and a lot more meter scale shallowing, that's probably a lot of the debris falling into that lake, protecting that lake from more melt. 
but everywhere you see red, those are those hot spots we want to focus on. So here we'll take a look at the main subbasin, which is changing the most. So after generating that map, um, I went back in May 2013 um, with this small grant and then transitioned to the Fulbright in August. Um, and part of the research there was to now, this is supposed to be unmanned, <laughs> but uh, the transport um, made it a bit, uh, something came loose. And so we had to tow it around with manpower. Um, but the point was to do open water transects because all the previous maps had been made when the lake was already frozen and just going point by point to figure out the depth changes. We can add a lot of valuable information using open water transects, which I'll show you next. This is the map that was created um, from that main subbasin, and this is overlaid on Google Earth's newest 2014 imagery. And this is what you can do with the side scan. You can create these three-dimensional models. So this is just one out of 16 here. Um, but the really neat thing is you can see the depth is 22 meters. You can also see structure, which hasn't been seen before. And if I zoom back here, where those hummocky terrains are, you can see the extent of it on the ground here. This part of the lake is emerged in 2001 versus the northern parts emerging in 2008, 2009. So this part is much younger, and you see that there's not been much erosion of these, these rocks up here. Something else we can do that um, I learned through this process is you can actually extrapolate a lot of information on what is in the lake, not just the depth, well, what is it made of? We think ice, right, but it's a really dirty lake. And so you can use multiple different returns and layers in your data to actually figure out what's soft and what's hard. So soft here is being interpreted as mud, so the lighter the color, the softer it is. And you can see it overlays in most of the spots where it's deep, which would make sense. All that mud is collecting in those deep pockets. And the smooth return, go back, soft and smooth, overlaps pretty well. So we can say the majority of the bottom of these deep parts of the lake are mud. So this is good, because we're going to prevent the melting. But where I have these black boxes, you don't see complete overlap with soft and smooth. So looking at the rough return, if you will, this is where there's rock. So everywhere along the shores of the lake, you're going to have a lot of rocks falling in. So that makes sense, especially along this part. The boxes don't overlay with that. But the hard returns here are overlapping with smooth. So the interpretation here is smooth and hard is where you have ice. And bare ice is going to melt a lot faster than if you have this debris layer. So these overlap with the hot spots that we've seen. Other places don't entirely overlap, and we're not entirely sure why, other than the debris may be very thin there. So these are areas that we're continuing to watch in the future because they're going to deepen at these faster rates. And this deepening process is not homogeneous, and so that makes it a more complex problem. And part of the efforts through the small grant and then continuing to the Fulbright year was to do uh, an outreach. And so I created the Sherpa Scientist Initiative in order to involve the locals in the, in the research. And so here we are working with the spectrometer, and that measures how reflective the snow and ice is. There's a lot of dust. There's a lot of pollution. That can enhance melting. So this was another effort that I don't have time to talk about, um, but there's a whole other section to my thesis just on black carbon and dust impacts and snow melt here. Here's the installation of the camera that you saw the footage from. And then this is shore crew for the day. We would alternate between shore crew with weather stations um, and, and land sensors and people that would go out into the lakes, row around the instrument, because it's a lot of hard work, 15,000 feet going back and forth to make sure you can create those 3D models. And then I'm going to end on some of the challenges that I encountered personally in the project. So equipment transport, helicopter drops, of course, those are going to be great. Um, lots of times you're carrying a lot of heavy equipment, six, seven porters. Uh, equipment maintenance, I would love to continue the Sherpa Scientist Initiative, so I'll be going back in October to continue these efforts, and bringing small laptops that they can use out in the field to maintain the weather stations that are actually still running now. And then stolen equipment was rare, but it did happen, um, and that was in instances when I couldn't hire help and I couldn't rappel down the cliff um, to put the instrument myself. So I would put it in locations that I thought were off the beaten track, but there's a lot of curious trekkers around. And with that, thank you. So a couple more things. Skylar, are we ready for the next video? Okay, so now we're going to um, see a video that I think was produced as part of the nominating process for, for Cesar for the um, Hillary Mountain Hero Prize, for which he is a finalist this year. Yeah, actually, for a team I nominated for the award oh, okay. in 2011. Uh, so Ben Schroeder was also 
He's a, a finalist or a nominee. Okay. So the, the video was made for Mountain Institute Award uh, for Cesar. I'll get out of the way and let us watch. César Portocarrero es uno de los pioneros en el Perú en el trabajo uh, de conservación eh, de glaciares. Las cosas están cambiando porque eh, el retroceso glaciar debido al cambio climático, al calentamiento global, está originando que los glaciares retrocedan. Por lo tanto, estas lagunas están creciendo. Entonces, las condiciones de las lagunas están cambiando. El trabajo en los glaciares es uno de los más difíciles y demandantes que puede haber. Requiere no solamente un gran sacrificio físico, pero una dedicación de toda la vida. Porque hay que tener en cuenta de que en esta zona hemos estudiado con detenimiento 68 lagunas, de las cuales hemos hecho obras en 35 lagunas. Obras que han sido reducir el volumen de las lagunas, construir diques de contención, diques de seguridad, obras hidráulicas. O sea, aproximadamente desde el año 95, obras que han sido reducir el volumen de las lagunas, construir diques de contención, diques de seguridad, obras hidráulicas. César es también una persona que le admiro mucho por el, el compromiso que tiene con la gente en la población de Huaraz. Es una persona eh, no solamente muy conocida, pero también querida en las comunidades, en las ciudades, y ha demostrado a lo largo de toda su vida un gran compromiso con el medio ambiente y con la gente de esta región. Nosotros debemos tener presente de que en el Perú, en la historia del Perú, la, el florecimiento y el decalimiento o colapso de las culturas peruanas ha sido debido al clima. Entonces, nuestra civilización, nuestro desarrollo está muy supeditado, depende mucho del clima. Si es que nosotros todos en conjunto vamos a trabajar, entonces podemos tener un futuro positivo. Cesar, do you want to come speak for a few minutes? Great. Thank you, John. Hello, everyone. It's my pleasure to be here today. I'd like to talk about the, the procedures and the methods that we apply to reduce the risk in the dangerous lakes of the Cordillera Blanca, which is the largest is now with mountain in Peru, in the Peruvian Andes. After the end of the Little Ice Age, mo almost most of the glaciers in the world have been receding, and the same happened in Peru. In Peru, we have uh, nine, 19 places in the Peruvian Andes where we have glaciers in the north, in the center, in the south. Cordillera Blanca is the largest uh, part of the uh, of, uh, western western side of the Peruvian Andes, which used to have 720 square kilometers in the 1970s. Now this area has been reduced in at least 35 percent, having less than 500 square uh, square kilometers of area. Then the, redu the, reducing of the reducing of this area is a big problem, not only for the water resources, but also because behind the, those vanishing glaciers, there are lakes, which some of them represent a big risk for the population, for the cities, for the valleys, infrastructure, and all where is in the watershed. In this picture, we can see what happened with one of the monitored glaciers since the 1970s and 80s, how this glacier almost disappeared. There is here also another example. 
then water is going, has gone, and all the valleys and all the cities that depend in the dry season of melt, uh, melting ice, then will have very shortly big problems, conflicts mainly. In 1932, one Austrian surveyor took this picture about Alcacocha Lake, what has been shown by Alton. And in that time also, he warned that perhaps could be a big problem with this lake if, if it outbursts. And nine years later, the, the lake outburst broke, opened a bridge here, and killed some thousands of people in Huaraz. Then, since that time, we started to work. The, the state, the government, created an office named the Lakes Control Office. Then, since, since that time, with the resources of that time, economical and technical resources, we start to work. Which are the factors for the hazard, for the threat of the dangerous lake? First of all, the first trigger are the hanging glaciers. It may uh, fall on the lake and produce big waves and produce the glow, the glacial lake outburst flood. And that's the first factor for the dangerous lake. We have a graph here showing the relationship between the temperature of the air in the place of the glacier and the slope of the bedrock that could produce the slide and the avalanche of ice and rock on the lake. For the temperate glaciers, like Peru here, where the temperature of the air close to the glacier is around zero degrees Celsius, we have that the slope, the critical slope, is around 24 degrees. In the case of Falcacocha, that also mentioned, the average slope of this mountain is 31 degrees. Then any time could be, may happen, and a slide of an ice mass and produce again in this lake a glow. The third factor is the increase of the volume. This graph shows how in 1974 we have a lake of half million cubic meters. When we did this small work in 1974, but now that the glacier, the glacier tongue disappeared, the, the lake has more than 17 million cubic meters. It means more than 34 times the, the volume that it had in the 70s. So the, the hazard is big. The fourth factor is the structure and the quality of, the, uh, of this dam. In this case, we have a very non-consolidated dam, uh, sandy and silty material, very erosionable, which could be eroded if there is an avalanche from the glacier to the lake. What we did to reduce the hazard, the, uh, the threat in the lake, the method that we apply uh, the factor that we could dra drive is the volume of the lake. So in all the cases, we have to reduce the volume of the lake. In the past, it has been used with hydraulic models, in laboratory hydraulic models. But now, we know that since the, in the 2000, 2005, has been developed some computer modeling. Then, in this time, it has to be applied a computer modeling to define which is the amount of water that has to be drained, which is the amount of meters that have to be taken down to reduce the volume of the lake. In the cases that the dam of the lake is a moraine, loose material, then we uh, make an open cut, V-shaped open cut, uh, let's see 15 meters, 20 meters, depending on the decision. After the studies of survey, survey, geological, geophysical studies. But if there is a rock dam, then we drill the tunnels. In some cases, some hundred meters, and in other cases, more than kilometer length tunnels. After to 
to reduce the volume, the volume of the lake, we build and reinforce the pipe to avoid the rise of the water again and to keep the desired volume in the lake. And third, to restore the dam, uh, in the case of uh, Moraine Dam, to restore the dam against the waves that could be produced by an avalanche. Here we can see how we, we used to work to reduce the to reduce the, the level, to take down the level of the lake. First, secondly, to, to build a, a pipe, uh, usually almost two meters diameter reinforces concrete pipe, and then to restore the dam against the waves that could be produced by the avalanche. But in, in some cases, it has uh, worked very well but in 2010, nature showed us that the prevention measure that we took was not enough. We left here a 20 meters rock freeboard and the ice avalanche produced a 30 meters wave. So it overtopped the, the dam and produces the panic in the population downstream. Then it's uh, important to take the, a good decision, how many meters we should take down. And I think it's important to introduce the term of the uh, reasonable or acceptable risk, which is because we cannot eliminate the risk. It's not neither economical, neither nor technical measure. This is the way that we have been working. These are pictures. In the, in the 70s and 80s, how we used to build the pipe to avoid the rise of the water, and some finished works. We made around 35 works in the Cordillera Blanca, which is a, a mountain range of about 180 kilometers length. The dams against the waves, the pipe, the conduct below the, the dams. In other cases, it is the largest lake in the Cordillera Blanca, almost close to four kilometers length and 79 million cubic meters. Then we had to drill a tunnel close to 1,300 uh, meters length, uh, which connect to the lake 60 meters below the, lay, the surface of the lake, and we connected when the lake was full. So we drained the lake, we made the studies after, and now this lake is used also to regulate around 45 million cubic meters for the use downstream. Which are the lessons that we learned? In the past, we used to work with the goodwill of all the population. Everybody was uh, accepted the, this kind of work. But now well, that the climate change uh, changes the pattern, the rainfall patterns, then people are also conscious, they are concerned about the water resources. Then both we have to work not only in risk reduction, but also in the integrated water resources management. It means that social management that we have to work, otherwise we, our projects could fail. Thank you. And one of the, uh, when we were down there two years ago, we were going to, I think, we were going on a field trip. I can't remember which lake we were going to. And I was in the back of the bus, second to last row, and behind me were Karma from Bhutan and Cesar, and they were talking about how to manage Imja Lake. Cesar had been working on it. Karma had ideas from a lake he had worked on in, um, in Bhutan. And they were discussing the advisability of using mechanical diggers or people with shovels. And it was just very fun listening to these two guys who had tons of experience and two of the kindest, most gently, gentle people in the world talk about how to, uh, how to manage a lake. Um, Next up, and this is our last speaker. I know I jumbled the order for you, keeping everyone, including me, on our toes and keeping enabling Skylar to keep up. Um, Greg Leonard with the University of Arizona is going to talk about, uh, 
I guess, evaluating or studying the SETI River disaster from three years ago. Um, Greg's group, along with another colleague of those of us who have been in Nepal, um, applied for and got a grant, uh, another one of the um, climate scientist grants, to analyze what was the cause of this um, sort of sudden and mysterious flood that occurred in uh, central Nepal. Um, so, Greg. Thank you, John. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for sticking around. Um, so yeah, in uh, 2013, I was involved with a high Himalaya field work project that involved an uh, investigation of a very severe and very tragic uh, flooding event that occurred in the center part of Nepal in May of 2012, the Seti River flood disaster. Now this uh, project was supported under the climber scientist solicitation um, and uh, also under USAID CCRD. And I am standing in today for Jeff Cargill. Jeff and I were both co-investigators on the project. Jeff was the lead investigator, and we both spent considerable time in Nepal and up and down the affected disaster area. And I remember there was a comment yesterday or a question about the relationship between um, the uh, aid and development community and academia research community. And I think this project really illustrates well that we both have common goals. Okay, which one here? Thank you. Yeah, so this uh, field investigation was uh, entirely um, funded by climber scientists, although uh, Jeff and I also leveraged some resources from another USAID NASA project called SEVERE, and we're very grateful to have all that support. And this just lists a lot of remarkable scientists, students, and climbers that were involved in the project as well. So I'll go over some background, uh, talk about the climber scientist program. You'll hear some science. This is climber scientist. And we'll review some conclusions and lessons learned. So here we are. This is where Seti River Basin is in the center of Nepal in the uh, very famous Annapurna Range. And now we'll zoom in here to this red box. And this is an Aster satellite sensor image that I projected into an oblique view and then draped over a digital elevation model. And in this image, red is uh, vegetation. White up here are the glaciers and snow. And the high catchment for the Seti River Valley occurs up here in this large feature called the Saab Chase Cirque. And this is a 10 kilometer wide alpine basin that's ringed by some of the world's highest peaks, including the well-known uh, Machu Picchu or Fishtail Peak. And inside this basin is this active ring of glaciers, and inside that, this uh, ancient glacial lake sediments, these magnificent towering sediments, which you'll see a picture of in a moment. And everything that melts or all precipitation within the basin flows out through this very narrow gorge, the Seti Gorge, down through a series of villages, including Karapani, and then off into Pokhara. So the first sign of trouble on May 5th, 2012, was witnessed by a tourist pilot, uh, Captain Maximov, who filmed from his wingtip camera this massive brown cloud here emanating off the shoulder of Annapurna 4. And a few minutes later, he saw a large wall of water cascading down the Seti Valley. Now, he instantly radioed back to Pokhara, and they sent out radio broadcasts warning about a flood, a potential flood. And that uh, line of action really saved a lot of lives. There's no doubt about that. Nevertheless, some 15 minutes later or so, the first of 27 flood waves crashed into Karapani village. And then another 10, 15 minutes beyond that into Pokhara. And some of you may have seen some of the YouTube videos. They're, they're really quite, quite sobering to see some of the, the tragic event that occurred there. Here's the view uh, post-flood in Karapani village, and you can see how the flood waves just ripped away all the vegetation and any structures that existed there. In all, 72 persons were killed. Uh, vital infrastructure was completely destroyed, roads, bridges, uh, temples, uh, buildings. Many families displaced and a lot of livelihoods lost. And not surprisingly, 
uh, the most affected people live on the lower terraces, and these are part of really what is a marginalized community, a word that we heard, a term we heard yesterday. Just uh, a view from inside the Saab Chase Cirque itself, this incredible amphitheater of peaks, uh, the towering ancient glacial lake sediments, which are really magnificent to see one of the active glaciers, and then uh, a rock scar here from the Annapurna 4 uh, rock fall, plus some old rock falls too. We realize that there's been some older rock falls in that same location, but uh, the last rock fall was uh, probably the biggest in a long time. So Jeff Cargill, my colleague, just happened to be in Nepal at that time, and he took a helicopter flight over the affected area and immediately realized that this requires an immediate field investigation. So fortuitously, the USAID Small Grants Climber Scientist Program was brought to our attention. And we saw some of the elements of that program, a focus on uh, high mountain remote settings, augmenting remote sensing studies, and working with uh, communities to um, adapt to the effects of climate change. And also importantly too, to try to develop the next generation of um, high mountain physical and social scientists. So we saw this as a really wonderful match for you know, the kind of answers that we had and the outcomes that we wanted to, to see. So uh, thankfully we got, the, we got the grant. A lot of really wonderful work done. Here's a, a long list of it, I won't go through it, but suffice it to say, we did complete a large amount of quality and quantity of work. Uh, the bullet points in blue, I just wanted to point out that in addition to uh, the physical science investigation, we also had members of our team spend uh, many months actually conducting socioeconomic surveys up and down the valley and uh, interviewing affected people from the disaster. And also, fortuitously, uh, we got onto a Weather Channel documentary and we're in episode six, uh, really remarkable. So this disaster actually got global scale coverage and we're really pleased about that. This is a view from space and some of the uh, phenomena from the flood that can be seen. Uh, the first top bottom pair shows the Saab Chase Cirque. This is that towering pile of ancient glacial lake sediments. 17 days after the flood, you see this, this layering, this draping of all the dust and avalanche material that came off of Annapurna 4. In this next top bottom pair, you can see how uh, down valley, the, the river was widened by the bulldozing action of uh, the flood waves that just stripped it uh, bare. So it went from an average of 20 or 30 meters in width to over 100 meters in some locations. I'd also like to mention that we in the research community, researchers, and a lot of N Nepalis were really surprised that um, we thought this was going to be a GLOF, a classic glacial lake outburst flood that happened relatively frequently in Nepal and more frequently with changing climate. But we found no evidence on satellite imagery or in the field of a large reservoir of water that was there and then had drained. So we had to be uh, you know, vigilant to see where, where did this volume of water come from. So here I just want to summarize some of the key observations that ultimately led to our interpretation for the flood event. The first is the, the gorge rockfall. The, the SETI gorge is much deeper than we thought. It's 1,500 uh, feet deep at least in, in locations. And that looking at time series satellite imagery, um, rockfall in the, the gorge is, is very uh, frequent. And we believe that rockfall did indeed occur from an image we viewed that was taken a few weeks before that dammed uh, the flow and hid a large reservoir of water in the gorge. Here's a close-up of that fine dust that we saw in the previous slide, and we, we did some uh, x-ray diffraction. So basically, this is like a mineralogic fingerprint that links the rockfall material off of Annapurna 4 with fine flood materials that we collected down in the valley. So it's sort of a link between the two, uh, the two uh, locations. Down trees, there's an incredible zone on the upper lip of the gorge of uh, flattened tree, just completely leveled and flattened. These were fresh trees. So this is evidence for us that the avalanche produced hurricane force winds and snapped these trees like toothpicks. Amazing. Um, and we also feel it had enough power to dislodge the dam uh, in, in the gorge. Uh, importantly, we had local knowledge that really contributed to the study too. Um, many locals reported two weeks or more before the flood event that the flow in the SETI River decreased significantly. So this is a, a, a key to us saying that this indeed is a time when the dam in the gorge, the rockfall, produced you know, a dammed uh, uh, flood, flooded area. 
Well, damn Lake. Um, here's our interpreted disaster sequence beginning up here in the upper left, and this is sort of two weeks or more before the event, two conditioning events, the rock fall into the gorge, the beginning of the development of the, the impoundment lake. This is the big rock fall that uh, Captain Maximov uh, saw. And then all this material plummets 10,000 feet down toward the city gorge. Spreads out, begins to pick up other material. It's picking up uh, snow and ice and melting that because of the friction of the, the avalanche. And also entraining a lot of the sediments from the, the, the glacial, the ancient glacial lake material. And all this is enough for us to you know, make its way down in here and then the outburst flood ensues. So SETI Valley and Poker are no strangers at all to catastrophic flooding. You see these beautiful sequence of horizontal terraces. While they are beautiful and they do sustain life in Nepal, however, they are the result of devastating much larger catastrophic floods that occurred hundreds of years in the past and thousands of years in the past. And this was a climate related uh, effect because we had large, large glaciers, you know, ice age size glaciers up in the Sabche Cirque and large moraines as well. And these held back large reservoirs of water. And when they catastrophically burst, this is the result. So, you know, nature giveth and nature can taketh away too. Um, so SETI 2012, you know, we cannot attribute this directly to climate change. Um, you know, we can speculate on a number of things, the rising of freeze thaw, elevations and things like that. However, there are these dangerous elements within the CERC, which I have listed here, and in particular, the increasing glacial pond development. This is climate related. It's not a matter of if, it's when. There will be more disasters in SETI Valley. This is a very dynamic system, and the melting of those glaciers up there and the creation of more reservoirs on those glaciers or underneath them will be a real threat to SETI and to poker as well. So we achieved, uh, we felt um, we achieved a lot of really remarkable outcomes, determining the cause of the flood, identifying vulnerable sites within SETI Valley, documenting again the socioeconomic factors that led to human losses in the SETI uh, River Valley, um, engaging, you know, especially engaging with local people uh, in the community with the socioeconomic studies and establishing trust between us and the research community and them uh, I thought it was really, really important. I feel like we gave voice to these people. We tabled results. We had discussions up and down the valley with people and formal uh, meetings in poker as well with officials. And we supported seven graduate programs, seven, okay? S six master's programs and one PhD, which is still in progress. And we have a peer review publication in progress. So our academic nutritional needs are being met as well. So um, it's very clear to us that, yeah, this is a small grants program, but small grants can and do lead to really meaningful outcomes. Lessons learned, oh boy. Um, the first three, Saab Chase, Cirque, and Gorge require monitoring. Solutions must accommodate purposeful relocation of people living in the stream bed or on the low terraces. And improve flood warning system needed. You know, when I first made this list, I thought, okay, this is fine, but these aren't lessons learned. This is... But I know now why I put them here because I realize that this is sort of recommendations. You know, we did a great job at assessment and scoping, really, really first rate. Okay, but now we're getting into design of these kinds of early warning systems and monitoring. Uh, so this is, you know, implementation and whatnot. And I was kind of relieved yesterday when I heard a lot of speakers talking about the difficulty in moving to this next step. So I, at one point I felt, you know, kind of, oh, wow, okay, me too. It's just, this is a really difficult phase here. And I also still feel like, wow, you know, maybe we could have done better. And so it just kind of something to think about. I don't have the answer here, but, you know, repartitioning of funds, I don't know, uh, leveraging from, you know, other organizations, NGOs, Nepali sources, but maybe it's the next step. This was a big pilot program for USAID. You know, maybe the next step in one branch of it could be to now, we got all these things on the shelf that we can do. So let's go, let's move to step three, four, and five. Uh, high mountain field work is essential. Local engagement is essential. That seems like a really obvious thing to put here, but I'll tell you what, you have to go to the field for the answers. As uh, Uliana mentioned, you know, you can't just look at satellite imagery. It's, it's a wonderful tool, but you have to go there for answers. You have to talk to people, engage with the community. We learned a lot. In fact, one of the key things we learned about the, uh, the flood was from uh, community members observing the river for us. Uh, I'm running out of time. I'll skip this last one, but... Um, Climber science for us, we feel, was really effective at focusing 
support for field science, for the community engagement. And again, you know, it is a small grant, but it led to large and meaningful outcomes. I just want to finish up with a few of my pretty slides, um, because this is climber scientist, and in the spirit that Alton shared with us earlier, uh, of, of scientists and explorers of old going to enjoy the magnificence of the alpine world and also enduring the hardships as well. So I hope you enjoy these. I'll just flip through them rather quickly. So please continue to join us in supporting vital high mountain field research and community engagement. It is your meaningful involvement, organizational and programmatic support, and financial and personal contributions that are essential, they are impactful, and they're really, really appreciated. So thank you.